All right, welcome to GathCast, episode 35. I am Dr. Sanders. And this is Robbie Gore. And today we're going to be talking about yet another, not nearly as listened to, I would say, but definitely well-known band in terms of goth and death rock music. Yeah, this is a band that I find is often referenced, yet I don't ever really hear people listening to them. Yeah, and that may be weird to say, but the band's Alien Sex Fiend. And one of the reasons that we say that is, you know, we have a lot of conversations with people and um, a bit of our fans with mm-hmm. about music. And one of the bands that we never really hear anyone actually ever mention in great depth is Alien Sex Fiend. Yeah. Usually they're mentioned in passing conversation, usually something about the death rock scene or the Bat Cave. Yeah. And people are like, oh, you know, I love them. And you ask them what the favorite songs are. Like, oh, I don't really listen to like a specific album or... Or you just see someone wearing an Alien Sex Fiend patch. Yeah. Something like that. And like there's that iconic image of Nick Fiend, mm-hmm. or that look that he always had. Yeah. So as a band, we're diving into it. Um, we weren't I mean, I was I was pretty familiar with this band, you know, the first few albums, but yeah, uh, it just is one of those things where I haven't seen a lot of bands go in depth with this one, and I thought it was time we gave it a shot. Yeah, so I just kind of covered it, and yet again, I will say that doing a band that is normally lumped in or categorized as death rock doesn't resemble Christian Death or Forty Five Grave at all. Yeah. The death rock scene is very interesting, it, especially for this band. This band is highly associated with the death rock scene. Anytime you see this band labeled, it's always going to be death rock for the most part. Anytime they come up in forums, it's usually death rock forums. People yeah. listen to death rock, mm-hmm. usually reference this band. Yet, having listened to these albums in depth for this episode, at least you know these first four albums, while I find elements of death rock in there... They're not the same kind of death rock that I'm used to listening to. Yeah, I would say that... In fact, I, I find a lot of industrial influences with them. Yeah, I would definitely say a lot of electronic yeah. stuff in there. Uh, but it's just... Yeah, it's just a strange genre. Like we talked about when we when we did 45 Grave, because you know, we did 45 Grave after we did Christian Death. Mm-hmm. I think the sound that most people associate with death rock is more of the Christian Death, you yeah. know, Roz Williams era, mm-hmm. you know, only theater pain sort of thing. Definitely. And... There is like that kind of electronic influence too, like especially, you know, yeah, come, come it, from like the ministry side of it, where or even kind of like the bands who were in between death rock and goth, who were like more post punk kind of things, like Red Lorry, Yellow Lorry, yeah. where they'd have you know like drum machines and kind of droning vocals and things like that. But this is a very different kind of sound. Yeah, this is very different, and uh, we just want to throw it out there. So just like when we did Forty Five Grave, and we said, if you're familiar with Christian Death, Forty Five Grave. Although being death rock does not sound like Christian death. Now you may be familiar with Christian death and 45 grave. Yeah. But this, alien sex doesn't sound like anyone. Yeah. Of them. <laughs> so I'll let you handle a bit of the history. Okay. Alien sex fiend was formed by Nick Wade, AKA Nick fiend mm-hmm. along with Christine Wade, also known as Mrs. Fiend. That's right. Along with David James, also known as Yaxi high riser. And yep. Johnny Freshwater, also known as Johnny Haha. Yeah. Which I find funny because Johnny Freshwater already sounds like a stage name. Yeah, it does, right? Right? Yeah. Um, but they were formed in late 1982 at the Bat Cave Club at which um, Nick worked. And uh, they became very well known in the gothic scene for their kind of dark electronic very sample heavy sound and this is where you know i liken them to many industrial bands Mm -hmm. is that they use lots of synthesizers they use you know drum samples and things like that in their recording they're very much not afraid to experiment with their sound and a big part of their sound is their vocal style which is this very kind of like crazy vocal that's like all over the place very manic yeah nick has a very unique sound to his vocals Mm -hmm. and uh it's (laughs) unmistakably punk rock influenced yeah Uh, but it has this really it has a very uh growly kind of thing i was gonna say at least on the first album um his vocals very much remind me of like early british punk rock vocals definitely Yeah. yeah i I definitely hear it with this this band that there's punk influence, especially with the the DIY kind of sound mm-hmm. of it. 
But yeah, the, of course, one of the big reasons that people are really familiar with Alien Sex Fiend is that they have a strong association with the Batcave in London. And, you know, the, the Batcave has its own history. In fact, we're, I'm actually working on a video of it. But it's a very idealized, you know, kind of like seen as like a holy place for a lot of the 80s goth sort of thing. Yeah. And I don't want to diminish the Batcave Club in any way, but I do feel there is this sort of pedestal that is placed on. Um, yeah. It's not all that unsimilar to or not all that dissimilar to the way people idealize maybe like parts of uh, West Hollywood and the Sunset Strip. When people think of the Roxy and the Whiskey A Go-Go, they think of these big venues like, oh, the Doors played at the Whiskey A Go-Go, but they don't realize that it's go, not yeah. that place anymore. Yeah, I don't... Uh, it's hard to say. But the, the point is, um, if anybody doesn't know anything about the Batcave, it was a very popular club and is very often associated with like you know the beginnings of goth and of course yeah all, all of the goth icons hung out there it was kind of the club that you could go to to listen to new and up-and-coming music yeah and for that time you know with the scene they were in it was largely going to be post-punk yep. goth and death rock mm-hmm. bands and it was where you went to hang out if you yeah. didn't really fit in at you know other kinds yeah. of clubs so you had nick cave hung out there uh robert smith susie sue um it was actually owned by i think it was the guys in specimen yeah I and mean, we i know we haven't talked about that band but that's that band actually has some pretty good music too it's located on i don't know if i'm pronouncing that right but Merritt street um cool. in soho which is part of london for those of you who don't know yeah so and it had its own kind of spooky like <laughs> diy in fact uh, you know I, I read a lot of things about it and it's actually really funny because um a lot of the articles that i read are tend to be written from people who actually you know been there yeah or they've interviewed people who went there and david J of the house is like really funny because he talks about just how cheap it was yeah he's like people like idealize this place he's like it's pretty much just like ripped up trash bags pinned to the wall and like and like makeshift spider webs well and that's what i'm i mean about it being akin to kind of like the west hollywood mm. uh sunset strip scene is that people forget that these places are just real places yeah like you know yeah exactly so um that was really funny but yeah apparently nick Fien worked there yep and um yeah actually the uh it's it's very hard to say exactly where Alien Sex Fiend fits in in terms of sound. Mm-hmm. It's it's a very, very strange sound. I <laughs> would say that it, it is very hard to categorize yeah. them. If I have to categorize them, I would say that they are a death rock band that is very industrial and electronic influenced. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, and, and death rock, I automatically assume there's a punk association with that, so obviously there's going to be you know kind of punky vocals and things like that yeah yeah this is uh, it's just a it's so different every every single one of these like pioneering death rock groups they always have like different elements of punk because none of them are like the same yeah like in terms of you know what they took influence from or what they decided to take like like yeah. Five grave took more like the instrumentation and well and yeah. plus there were so many subgenres of punk at that point so you know a band could be mm. into punk and they'd be into a very different kind of punk than someone else like uh yeah. you know christian death was very much associated with like the la hardcore kind of yeah, scene yeah. whereas a band like 45 grave was more associated with kind of like uh the more campy side of mm. punk like the like rockabilly-esque kind of things yeah. and uh you know yeah. more the rock and roll punk if you will well, that's just one of the things too is that you know, Prefab Grave and Christian Death are all from America. Yeah, and then Alien Sex Fiends from, you know, London. So well, yeah, they're largely credited to helping form the death rock scene in uh, Southern England, whereas Forty Five Grave and you know Christian Death are attributed with starting the death rock scene in California. Yeah. So yeah, well, let's get on to the first album. So we're going to find out who's been sleeping in my brain. <laughs> <laughs> I will I'll give it to them. They, they got some uh, some decent album titles. Uh, yeah, it's so this released in 1983. Yeah, so this is a year after their formation. Prior to this, they, uh, they released a cassette along with Youth from The Killing Joke, which helped gain a lot of popularity for them. And they were also featured on a compilation for 
the uh, Bat Cave Club. Yeah. Um, and that was, so that was a huge part of them taking off in the scene. And so just a year later, they recorded their debut album through the label Anagram. Yeah. And so while you did have some uh, like singles being released beforehand, like Ignore the Machine, which was actually probably one of my favorite songs from them. Yeah. Uh, and it did do okay. But um, the actual first album is Who's Been Sleeping in My Brain. And it was recorded in two weeks, so apparently like two weeks in the beginning of the year yeah. of 1983, and was released later that November, so mm-hmm. November 11th. And what we have is a a very distinct album. Yeah, I, I would say so. It's hard to know where to start with this album. Well, it's kind of like in that it's hard to know where to start with the Alien Sex Fiend in terms of their sound and everything. I'll say this, it's... Um, an album that apparently was produced in you know a very short amount of time, and uh, has a very DIY aesthetic. Yeah, very much so. <laughs> um, it it doesn't have very strong production. This has to say it has bad production, but you know you, you can tell that it was recorded you know in a short amount of time. Yeah. Um, there is not a heavily placed influence on production value for the album that's not necessarily a bad thing but it's definitely part of its sound so you're going to have you know kind of punkier sounding guitars and by that i mean you're gonna not really have a ton of mids and bass presence on tracks and yeah that's one thing that is kind of you know lacking in this album is a presence of a like a bass guitar yeah in fact it's uh it's pretty hard to hear bass frequencies at all on this album, really. Really, all it comes from is either the keyboards or the loads of the guitars. I mean, there's there's really no bass yeah. on this album. Uh, it's kind of just drums, guitar, keyboards, well, and singing. There literally isn't bass. Yeah, so yeah, like, exactly. It, if there is any bass frequencies, they're played by the keyboards. But the way this album is EQ'd, it doesn't lend itself to any of those bass notes shining out as bass notes. So it kind of just sounds like a lot of high end. Yeah. Um, which, you know, some people might like. For me, you know, it's not the kind of production that I typically like. Um, and I don't necessarily need to have albums be overproduced or like have crazy production value. Yeah. But I do like to see kind of a more even frequency response. Uh, yeah, it just kind of isn't exactly what I look for in an album. Uh, I uh, I just uh, man, it's like tough. <laughs> it's, what I will commend this album for doing, while I don't necessarily enjoy the production of this album, I think that there's a great energy to the album. I think that Nick is particularly interesting to listen to. He has like a great raw grittiness to his vocals, and you know, listening to it while the production might have bothered me, I could easily see how this band might be enjoyable to see live. Yeah, I definitely think that was probably where they shined. Actually, there's an there's an album. Um, we're not getting to it on this episode, but there actually is a live album. Yeah. But yeah, I think that a lot of what might have worked really well for yeah. them might not have translated as well to this album, just because it's it's a really harsh sound. And I don't mean like you know like oh it's really aggressive, you know, because we listen to so much aggressive stuff. Yeah. Um, I think it's just like the way that everything's placed in this album it just is really like it, it's very yeah. trebly it's very it's, diy it's a little ice picky in the ear yeah exactly um but yeah like like you said nick's vocals are are very aggressive and there's a lot of energy there's a lot of passion mm-hmm. in this which i think it really comes through yeah and i think that's a big element of their punk influence yeah is just that raw energy t- and I think that comes from them, you know, playing places like the Batcave, which yeah. would have, you know, would have been akin to a punk club for you yeah. know, the goth scene, essentially, or the death rock scene, mm-hmm. you know, however you want to look at that. Those terms weren't necessarily around at yeah, that time. exactly. But, you know, you could definitely tell that they cut their chops playing for people. And I think that that's what they were going for on this album. Yeah. But I just don't feel like, the way they recorded it lended itself well to capturing that sound. Yeah, yeah, I, w- I would agree with that. And um, one thing I do want to mention about this album is that actually there is two different covers for this album. 
uh, if I think it was if you're in America, it has this weird picture of these guys standing around. Uh-huh. And then if you got it, I think anywhere else, it has like this kind of like the brain stem sort of thing. Yeah, it's like this veiny brain stems with kind of like little brains inside of the brain stems. Yeah. <laughs> it's a very interesting uh, album cover. Yeah. Um, and just in case you're wondering what some of the songs that we really enjoy i think i mean other than ignore, ignore the machine which i i really like i think actually my my favorite song is actually i'm her frankenstein i heard frankenstein's really good yeah um i kind of liked uh new christian music as well mm-hmm. wish i was a dog i didn't care for nah. as much <laughs> that, that was definitely a track that i felt like was a little lackluster for me yeah wigwam wipeout was kind of cool in its own like quirky little way yeah and then uh i kind of like lips can't go like oh. the, those were my my tracks. I yeah. see. What do you think about this album and compared to current Death Rock? Or what Death Rock? Like what Death Rock has become? Basically. Yeah. I mean, um, do you think it was really influential to it, or do you think fans I'm, like? If I'm being honest, I don't. I don't see a direct correlation between like Alien Sex Fiend and modern Death Rock. I think that a lot of modern Death Rock bands pull more from bands like Christian Death. And occasionally from bands like 45 Grave, I almost see 45 Grave influencing more of like the punk and the rockabilly and the Mm -hmm. psychobilly scene and things like that. Yeah. Whereas Christian Death, I feel like we're much more progenitors of the modern current day post-punk death rock scene. Yeah. I was just uh, wondering your opinion on that. But as far as finding this album, it's actually pretty, pretty simple to actually find track down and, um, and listen to the alien sex fiend has actually been very nice about their music yeah uh they'd let like everything on spotify and i will say though it, because i do occasionally listen to things on youtube mm-hmm. when uh you know i just want to find something uh, quickly yeah. um all the tracks are on there but no one's made a good like compilation for the album mm-hmm. to like you know link all the tracks oh together. yeah and I noticed that with a lot of their albums, like there was incomplete ones or there was a yeah. lack of one for a certain album. But if I searched the songs individually, they would all come up. Yeah. And actually to give some people some perspective, I, I mean, just in case people aren't quite as familiar, I know that probably the most popular song from them is Now I'm Feeling Zombified. Yeah. Uh, which, you know, when you type it into YouTube or anything like that, like we do quite, I, you know, I try to ask people like what they most often associate with the band. And overwhelmingly, people associate now feeling zombified yeah. with Alien Sex Fiend. Uh, I do want to point out, this song wasn't even in the 80s. I don't know, it was 1990 when that song was released. So I thought that was really funny. Yeah. <laughs> well, and a lot of times when I go into record stores and I see any Alien Sex Fiend at all, it's not from their early material. Usually it's stuff in the late 80s or early 90s. Yeah. So it's, I just thought that was, you know, kind of funny, uh, especially since most people obviously associate them with, you the know, Bat Cave. Yeah, well, like and... the early 80s or whatever, but they're the most popular song, at least I think most people are familiar with, is actually from 1990. Yeah. Kind of like when we did Susie and the Banshees, like, yeah. you know, and then we did Superstition. So, mm-hmm. um, kind of reminds me of that. So, um, that's Who's Been Sleeping in My Brain. That is Who Has Been Sleeping in My Brain. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay, so now it's time for recent interesting goth stuff. AKA Riggs. And uh in this recent interesting goth stuff, we want to talk about some recent interesting goth stuff that we did personally. Yeah, or that happened to us. Yeah. Per se. Yeah. <laughs> and so uh we had some weird times yeah. in, over the last week. So um because it was Robert's birthday weekend. Yep. Um on what was it like yeah the 20 we had several celebrated from like 22nd to like 25th or whatever yeah <laughs> and so so we packed in a whole bunch of activities and um and you might even see on instagram we posted a photo from it yeah <laughs> i look very happy in that photo um but uh we did see um for, first we saw this joy division trivia band yep and they were very interesting I thought they were actually pretty good. Yeah. Because thought... um, you never know with a Joy Division cover band. Like, it can go either way. Yeah, definitely. Um, but this one was very good, I felt like, at least as far as Joy Division cover shows I've gone to see. Um, 
I didn't understand. They had a bunch of Christmas trees placed all over. Yeah, um, I think that was called moving units. I think. Yeah, the, yeah, they were called moving units. If anybody understands what the correlation between Joy Division and Christmas trees is, please explain it to us. I just, because no. there was Christmas trees everywhere, and we couldn't figure out why. Yeah, I don't. Uh, I don't know. That was weird. We were trying to figure out like if there's any lyrics that had Christmas trees and stuff. We uh, found like something about trees, but it wasn't Christmas trees. Oh, Christmas in July. I don't know. I I don't know. I don't know. But yeah, when um, I just didn't like. I really. I'm. I'm sorry if they listen to this, uh, but I really did not like the singer of the band. I didn't mind him that much. I felt like they could have chosen a different singer, but I felt I felt like he was a decent fit. But the sound of the band themselves was really good. Yeah, felt, the like, band was good. really solid. Yeah, and so the vocals didn't I don't know, they didn't really bother me. Like I didn't feel like they were, they were the world's greatest Ian Curtis, mm-hmm. you know, renditions. But yeah. uh, I felt like it was a, you know appropriate enough mm-hmm. cover. Yeah, and um, then... Uh, but probably the most interesting part of that show... Yeah, it was Prayers came out, yeah. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, so when... Probably through the performance, Rafael Reyes from Prayers... Or everybody just calls him Prayers. I just call him Prayers. Well, he pretty much is Prayers. <laughs> <laughs> came out, you know, and in case anybody doesn't know Prayers is, it's the Cholo Goth movement. And yeah. and if you listen to the <clears throat> new Cemetery Confessions, you hear me talk about that album a little bit. Yeah, basically Rafael Reyes pioneered the cholo goth movement yeah um sd kill was pretty good um yeah i'm just saying right now yeah. um but yeah he came out and he did his whole thing and he sung some uh ian curtis but yeah. man he definitely did it in like his he did it the prayers, prayers way, way. <laughs> instead of being like love love he's like love love will tear us apart again <laughs> like it was it was very much very much prayers. Yeah. Man, he's shredded in real oh, life. Oh, I know, right? He's like, he's, he's friggin' like insanely shredded in real life. <laughs> Even more so than inside of the music videos. I was like, oh, like Jesus Christ. Like, it was, it was crazy. Yeah, it was, it was interesting seeing him in real life. Um, mostly because I just, I didn't in- expect us to see them anytime soon. Yeah. Like, I figured, like, if we went to see them, it would be, like, at a small club. Because they're playing bigger festivals and stuff right now because yeah. they're getting a lot of popularity. Mm-hmm. And we don't usually go to those sorts of things. Cause yeah. we're not really festival people. We're not really, no. <laughs> <laughs> I like people show up a little bit late and yeah. leave and go home. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, yeah, it was really interesting seeing him there. It was kind of having, like, having a mini prayers concert yeah sort of. it's pretty cool <laughs> i was i was very blown away by that yeah uh also really sh- like he is short yeah he's short. <laughs> but, uh, but, but very very buff hey yeah, man i ain't knocking him he looks good yeah no i ain't uh you know it's just just prayers just so shredded i was just really surprised by how muscular he was right <laughs> um that's a very sweaty um, <laughs> um okay in other news <laughs> Uh, this is very we have another concert show. Yeah, uh, so, then, story. so then we went to um, Only Theater Paint. I can't remember if this was the day before or the day after. I think it was the day, day after. Yeah, day yeah. after. Um, so then we went to go see the band Only Theater Paint. And anybody who doesn't know, Only Theater Paint is made up of uh, most most fa- famously Rick Agnew and Katani Damone. Yeah. It and, had um, Eva O oh was fronting the band at one point, but she no, is no longer fronting the band. It's currently uh, Steve Skeletal. Was she fronted the band at one point? I thought she was fronting Christian Death 1334 or something. Or I believe uh, it's okay. Like it, it's fine. So I don't know. She was form. I know she was fronting some Christian Death sort of thing like that at some point, but I'm not sure if it was only theater pain. I know it involved Rick Agnew. Maybe that's why I think. Maybe the- yeah. <laughs> um, but then. Uh, Kitani is involved in too because apparently she and um, Rick Agnew are in a relationship. Yep. And so, uh, but this band's fronted by like Steve Skeletal and, um, but really good band. Like, <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, but so we showed up to um, club, really, you know, small bar, you know, yeah. kind of thing. Uh, it was OC Gathering. And um, great gathering, by the way. Yep. DJ spinning some pretty decent tunes and everything. Yeah, it was at the OC Steel House. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And so it was a lot of fun. You know, we're just hanging out, talking to people. Oh, we ran into a fan too. That was cool. Yeah. Um, and so Psycho Cat something. Ninety four. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so yeah, we were just kind of you know just doing the doing the guy stuff, dancing, and kind of just having some fun. And 
and uh you know just talking to people about you know just doing, doing what we normally do yeah and so Being ourselves uh band came on about it was about midnight 11 midnight or it was something. like 11 30 yeah. and so uh right off the bat first of all steve skeletal was like freaking like six foot five oh, he's, huge. he's so tall just like the tallest person no I've platforms ever seen. Yeah. no platforms no he's wearing full on uh you know like pikes like just flat pikes yeah it's crazy and um he was a good foot above everyone else yeah this one <laughs> this is always what struck me right away um and so yeah they come on and Seems like right off the bat, like Rick. Oh, by the way, we we actually contemplated not telling the story, but we figured like I don't know that we just we just would. I mean, <laughs> I don't know. Like we we thought about it, but I don't know. It, it's if people wanted to hear, there's probably videos of it already on the internet. Probably, and if people want to hear our experience about it, you know, they actually want to know what we do in our yeah. lives and what we experience. This was something that was kind of crazy. So, yeah, the band was uh, setting up, and Rick Agnew kind of looked a little bit. You know, he was kind of looking mad at the amp. Yeah, he was looking very frustrated. Um, the band stated they were having technical difficulties. Um, initially, they were having trouble just getting sound out of the amp. But it's, like, at a certain point, they were able to get a guitar sound out of the amp. Yeah, and at it, which point it sounded said, fine to me. Yeah, I it, mean, it sounded fine to me. Like, I don't know if there was, like, a problem with it coming through the monitors. They couldn't hear it. I don't know. But Rick Agnew became more and more aggravated and... It seemed like something was off about him that night. I don't yeah. want to create any allegations. Oh, I just, I, you know, I won't either. But it seemed like, it seemed like, uh, he was acting extremely differently than the rest of the band was. Like, yeah, completely out of unison. And I could even see that the the band was very seemed to be very upset with him. Yeah, I mean, and we, of course, we're not the band, but yeah, from what we from could what see, we could and see. we were pretty freaking close. Yeah. Uh, we were pretty much as close to front row as you could be, but like we were like right behind the people that were front row. Um, but yeah, it seemed like the band was very irritated and kind of just giving them looks, especially the you know the drummer and the bassist for kind of like. Well, basically, what ended up happening was Rick Agnew kind of just soloed over like the first four songs. Yeah, and then all of a sudden, just meanwhile he's repeatedly going back to his amp and just smashing it with his fist yeah yeah um and then he did play spiritual cramp yeah, and roman's stress like, that's where i was going was like all of a sudden he cued the band and they went into two christian death songs like perfectly well the 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 two christian death yeah, songs like, like you the know. most popular yeah um and he played those great like you know the whole band so great on those songs and then he kind of went back to being infuriated and hitting the guitar amp and at this point, it seemed like there was no real return. Yeah, he just kind of got frustrated, and I th- I think he knocked the amp down or something. But he just the main point of what he ended up doing was just unplugging the guitar and yeah, he walking just unplugged off and the guitar and walked and slammed the door. Yep. Like he went backstage and just slammed the door, and the band was like, uh, the band stayed there for a few minutes. I think like they were like, trying to coax him to come back yeah. out. Yeah. But uh their statement was uh nah. they were having technical difficulties and so they could not finish the performance yeah it was a really awkward thing i mean especially since the, i don't know, it's just it was just really awkward i mean like yeah it's you know nobody i mean we're i mean i'll put it this way we watched 45 grave and they, they went three through amps. three guitar amps that each one like basically just they blew the head yeah and they kept going, yeah, like like champs. They didn't even stop. Oh, they didn't even stop songs. No, no, like it was awesome. They did part time all bass. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, like it just they were getting a guitar sound, and I guess as far as I could tell, it just wasn't up to Rick's standard or something like that. And then, I mean, she, it wasn't the world's perfect guitar sound, but it was something they could have used. Like. Yeah. But yeah, he just got mad and stormed off, and that was a uh, seemed very very angry and. It just seemed like something was off. Um, yeah. I, nah. We're not going to comment nah. on why we think it's nah. off because we feel like that's unfair. <laughs> yeah. So we don't know. Um, but that was our experience here. So we were in the audience and we saw him storm off. We heard him slam the door and the other band looked really confused and the band looked really agitated. And Yeah. Particularly the bass player looked, and the drummer looked very upset. I think the drummer looked like piss. Like, yeah. In my it, like it looked like at one point like Steve had to turn around and calm the drummer down and be like it's okay we're gonna finish the show like and then 
Rick just left. <laughs> yep. So, uh, yeah, we were, yeah, we just, we hung, I mean, after that, you know, because it was only like 30 or 40 minutes they were on stage or something yeah. like that, you know, and. I will say Steve held his composure really well. Like, even after Rick left and, like, the band got off stage, he came out and he was greeting fans. Their bass player and the drummer kind of hung out, but they just kind of stayed in their little booth. But, like, Steve went around and he was saying hi, taking pictures with people. And so I appreciate that he was able to handle the situation with that kind of grace. Yeah. So that was our experience. It's yeah. the only theater pain. <laughs> It was definitely an interesting one. We've seen a lot of weird shows. We have seen a lot of weird shows, and it's always by bands or including members of people from really, you know, that we really love. Yep. And then it always <laughs> goes so weird. Like, yeah, like 45 Grey, like we saw them, they were really good, but then all this stuff started happening with their equipment and they're blowing heads and all this stuff. And then, and then like we saw Rick Agnew with Only Theory of Pain, which is like really great. And then Katani was there and it was like really awesome. Yep. And then like, then that storms off the stage and we only get to hear like a few songs yeah uh it's just like it's so oh then prayer shows up like yeah it's prayer shows up to a show that we didn't really think it's like five dollars yeah yeah it's like five (laughs) dollar show just shows up there it's like and love torn apart (laughs) (laughs) yeah it's been been some weird got me in the prayer spirit though now i kind of want him to play a small club so we can go see him seriously yeah (laughs) Well, I love other I person anyway. So, <laughs> that's that new album, man. That new album is so disappointing. But yeah, it's, it's, been, it's been a weird week. So, that's pretty much all the news. Uh, mm-hmm. Blu ray's coming out, but I don't, there's nothing exciting for me. Yeah. So, yeah, if you're going to go see Only Theater Pain or Rick Agnew, I guess expect a, a show. Yep. <laughs> so, um, that has been recent interesting guy stuff. All right, now we're on to Acid Bath. Yeah, so this is going to be their second studio album released in 1984, so just Mm -hmm. a year after their last album, again on the same label, Anagram. I wasn't actually able to find a ton of historical information about this album. Mm -hmm. That seems to be kind of a problem for Alien Sex Fiend. There's enough information to gather about them and Mm -hmm. their association with, you know, the Batcave and things like that, Mm -hmm. but... As you go later into their career, there's not a lot documented on them. Yeah, unfortunately. I find that to be the case. And the information you tend to run across seems to be the information you already know. Yeah. <laughs> That's basically the way I'll I'll put it. But um, as far as uh, second album, Acid Bath. I find this to actually be a really good follow-up to the last album. It's very similar. It, it is similar, but I find that there's an increased value of production for this album. Yeah. And that was a huge gripe for me for the last album. Yeah. And so f- for that to be fixed for me was definitely a nice step in the right direction, I think. Yeah. And, you know, that's not to say that this album is without flaws. There's certainly, you know, songs in this album that I don't really care for. Yeah. But I definitely found myself enjoying this album a lot more than I did the last one. Yeah, I totally agree. Um, I think that the songs on here... Maybe of the same caliber, I'll say that, you know? Yeah. In the, the way that they're written and everything, but just the way that it's all put together, I think, works a little bit better. Yeah. There's a lot of energy on this album, and I feel like it's actually captured, for the most part, properly, because everything isn't super tinny sounding or ice picky. Yeah. You really get a chance to feel the energy of the songs hit you. Yeah. Yeah. Some of my favorites, um, I think my favorite... <laughs> song on the whole album is actually Hee Haw which actually I'm pretty sure is one of their more popular songs or Here Come the Bone People uh, <laughs> uh, I think that Hee Haw is uh, my second favorite I actually my favorite was Bone Shaker Baby oh yeah 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 Hee Haw is kind of like a intro to Bone Shaker Baby mm-hmm. but Bone Shaker Baby is this great kind of gothabilly kind of whore punk kind yeah. of sound to it mm-hmm. very like punk rock meets the monsters kind of sound yeah and uh and so in that way it kind of reminded me of 45 grave or at least some of their tracks yeah but i i really enjoy that track i thought it was a very strong one for that album it had you know the swing of gothabilly or Mm -hmm. rockabilly or whatever you want to call it yeah but it maintained like the darkness and the creepiness of a goth and death rock and so i felt like there's a cool balance in that song yeah i i totally agree with that one thing I will say 
that I didn't like about this album was sometimes I felt like there was a mismatch between the instrumentation and the vocals at times. And it could be due to the way it was mixed, not necessarily EQ'd, but just the way things were placed. Sometimes it feels like vocals sit too above like instrument tracks or vice versa. Yeah, I would say that's that's kind of a common problem with the Alien Sex Fiend, honestly. Yeah. Uh, And I think that might just be because of the style of the music Mm -hmm. uh, and Nick's voice. Yeah. So... But yeah, it's definitely apparent on on a lot of their tracks that, you know, maybe the voice is too loud or maybe the instruments are too loud. Yeah. But that's like what this death rock is, right? It doesn't have to be didn't have to be disintegration every time, right? I mean, to a certain extent, that's true. You know, it is inspired by, you know, the <laughs> punk scene, DIY, do it yourself. I'll just say yeah. that this album does do, I think does it better than Who's Been Sleeping in My Brain. Oh, I completely agree. And that's why, you know, I, I wanted to give credit to them definitely i think making a better album Um, yeah and for me what i consider to be i think my favorite of the four we're going to be talking today about today really this one yeah oh i'm surprised um yeah just for me i I felt like this was at least kind of uh more in line with uh their early kind of sound yeah while still having the production value that i wanted from it and it wasn't necessarily perfect production but, you know, it was enough to keep me engaged. And I really enjoyed that. It, we'll get to it later, but particularly on, like, the next album, I felt like there was good songs on there, but I felt like they were mixed so badly that I couldn't enjoy them. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We'll get to that. But another song that I really liked was uh, Break Down and Cry. Yeah. I thought it had some really cool aggression to it. Mm-hmm. It was a little less industrial influence and more yeah. kind of straightforward death mm-hmm. rock vibe to it. It also was a little more melodic because they a lot of their songs aren't very heavy in melody. No, they're definitely not. Yeah. It's more about um, the energy. And then another song that I really liked was... Uh, was actually the first song of the album was In God We Trust. Mm-hmm. Um Particularly because I felt like there was a lot of callbacks to early like British punk bands. Yeah. Like the vocal was very much reminded me of something like the Buzzcocks or Sex Pistols or yeah. something in that kind of vein. That's weird. We're doing a band called In Sex Fiend. You mentioned a band called Buzzcocks and we're talking about a band called the Sex Pistols. It's <laughs> <laughs> funny. Yeah. But then I guess some negatives for me. Dead and Reburied, I felt like had really good instrumentation, but I didn't really like the vocals on that track. Mm-hmm. I felt like they droned on a little too much. Yeah, that's actually one of the, the biggest problems I think a lot of people note with Alien Sex Fiend is actually the repetitiveness of some of their yeah. music. And these are not short songs. I yeah. mean, let's be honest. I mean, most of them are five to six minutes mm-hmm. long. And they just, um, yeah, because of the their particular style and the way that they write music, I will say that it can be a little repetitive at times. Yeah. And I think pretty much every reviewer has noted that on, you know, every professional reviewer has noted that. Mm -hmm. And I think they tend to look at it as they would look at other albums. Yeah. But obviously this band is kind of, it's kind of what they do. Yeah. They do their own thing. Yeah. And then the track, uh, it's EST parentheses trip to the moon. Yeah. I really did not like that track. Nah. Uh, it's just not for me <laughs> for one it's eight minutes long and it's so monotonous yeah. i felt like that like if they cut that track and maybe gone with something else it would have made a substantial difference to the album considering there's only eight tracks total on this yeah that's one of the things i didn't i didn't really understand is like you know it's just like man like this song's still going on <laughs> like <laughs> I'm like, oh yeah, it's like, it's like, but there's only so many tracks, so I, I don't know why. I mean, like, I know eight's kind of like the minimum for an album like them, but I don't know. I feel like they probably could have thrown something together a little more. In fact, actually, I think when they re-released, or at least edited that song more. Yeah. Like, well, I think uh, when they re-released it, they actually added like bonus tracks. They did, yeah. So it's just like, come on, man. Yeah, right. Like they couldn't <laughs> have gone with something else. <laughs> yeah. No. I don't know. Maybe someone likes that song. It, it wasn't for me. Sorry. <laughs> Uh, any songs that you cared for particularly on this album, Donnie? I just think "He How" is like the best. Like, yeah, it's actually probably like my favorite song from them. Yeah, uh, and that's probably my favorite. I mean, I feel very okay with these albums. It's just not my my thing particularly for for Alien Sex Fiend. I will say that I the songs I like I really do enjoy. No, I, I yeah I have to agree with you. But the songs that I'm just kind of 
meh about. I'm really meh about, or I just don't want to listen to him. Yeah. And I think it is a re- repetition nature, but like EST, yep. it's just like, that is kind of the example of stuff. That I just don't dig from them. Yeah. For me, uh, I think the tracks that like I really, really liked happen more on these first two albums, but they weren't produced the way I wanted them to be. Yeah. And then when we get to the the next two albums, which we're going to talk about, I, f- I had a hard time enjoying them. I think I enjoyed the last of the four. Oh, more. okay. Here we'll we'll get to okay, it. Okay, all right. Yeah, I'll save it. So, but what what are your what's your final word on Acid Bath? Um, the cover's awesome. The cover is amazing. <laughs> the art is really cool. It's got like this blue. I guess he's an alien sex fiend. Oh <laughs> my um, god! But yeah, you kind of this creepy alien-esque looking creature who's got big orange eyes and red lips and his two little buck teeth and uh it's just really kind of psychedelic art yeah um it's really interesting but yeah i guess overall i would say i'm trying to be as unbiased as possible about this review because i think i'll be honest alien sex fiend is not my favorite band yeah they're not a band that i really put on very often and uh i don't really talk about very much <laughs> Listening through these albums, I was trying to be objective as possible. Uh, I would recommend this album if you're into Alien Sex Fiend. Yeah. I, I guess that's my take on it. Because mm-hmm. I'm not sure if people will be into them or not. I feel like you either love them or you hate them kind of thing. Yeah. At least that's how I feel about them. Yeah, you know, I, I actually really agree with that. Is that this is either a band that you either can really get into and wrap your head around. Yep. Or you just... Or not into them. I mean, like, we even had it when we did um, Fields of Nephilim. We kind of said that sort yeah. of thing. I actually feel like Alien Sex Fiends even more so. Oh, I would say definitely way more uh, so. Because I feel like when we talked about Fields of Nephilim, you know, Carl McCoy's vocal is such a distinct vocal that, you know, I felt like it kind of distanced some people. You know, some people just wouldn't be into the growly sort of vocal. I feel like all of Alien Sex Fiends yeah. is like Carl McCoy's vocal and that it's either a love it or hate it situation mm-hmm. while you may you know i feel like people for field and like say, say they aren't into karma because they're like oh i really like the guitars or something you know yeah and you see that a lot with like uh like heavy metal and stuff people mm-hmm. are like oh i really like the the way the the instruments or the drum sound but i don't like the vocalist yeah and i found myself feeling that way a lot about alien sex fiend you know like like I said, trying to be objective as possible. Mm-hmm. But my personal opinion is that while I find a lot of the instrumentation to be very interesting, I don't particularly care for Nick Fiend's voice. You know, I, it doesn't. It's not a bad thing. Like yeah. it's not a bad voice, but it's not for me. Like I, you know, I it his voice doesn't doesn't bother me that much. It, yeah, it's not my favorite. Um, Peach is my favorite, but I, I think <laughs> that's what bothers me more. Is that it's just for me kind of boring. Oh, I would I wouldn't say that, but I mean, in my opinion, but but I get it. Like, I totally I totally understand. Yeah. Like, I think actually for me, it's um, that I tend to really like 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 drums and guitar and stuff. Yeah, and it doesn't really suit that very well. It's just it's just such its own thing. Like, and that's why I think some people absolutely love it. Yeah, and that's why I really think you know it's a great band to talk about. There are songs I like. But yeah. But this isn't like the end all be all get a tattoo of them, you know, like gonna be the best thing ever sort of band for me. Um yeah, certainly. But that's acid bath. Okay, now we're on to Maximum Security. Yeah, so this is the third studio album by Alien Sex Fiend. Yeah. And released I, in nineteen eighty five. So again, just another year after the last album. Yeah. So this is uh, October of eighty five. Uh I do wanna say that this is actually their highest charting album that they ever had uh it reached number 100 yeah on the uk album charts and if you are familiar with the songs dead and buried and ignore the machine they were actually re-released around this time and they charted too like in the 90s so this was kind of their heyday i mean you could say that in some way but this album i have to say i i don't seem to see what yeah, I'm going to completely agree with you. This is where I'm probably going to offend people who are fans of Alien Sex Fiend. Of the albums we're talking about today, I think this is the worst for me. I find this album to be so repetitive and so monotonous that I really couldn't enjoy it 
and on top of that not necessarily the production of the album was bad in that like equalization was terrible or Mm -hmm. like you know the frequency curve was off yeah it was just unique the mixing was so like i don't know who mixed this like there's like there's they went from having vocals that were like arguably too far above the instrumentation Mm -hmm. to having vocals that are like buried by the instrumentation yeah there's sometimes where you just can't even hear nick on this album (laughs) um and then there's times where like the like everything is just so loud like Mm -hmm. all the like keyboards or anything that and it has this weird sort of like fuzziness to it yeah it's hard to explain it feels like really like it was recorded really cheaply like yeah I i don't know what the story is behind it because there's no real information on this album's recording yeah we tried to find what we could on the actual production there's there's not much there's a little bit more on the on the next one but unfortunately like we said for alien sex being it kind of the more it goes on the less information is kind of you know about <laughs> about their career yeah um and yeah i don't know what is up with this album but it definitely feels like a step back for me even in terms of art i mean honestly yeah the art is really plain like it just looks like a diy like show poster for a punk band yeah and this is of course a year after their last album so and maybe they were trying to get back to more uh, punk influences you know being that they were death rock band i don't know like i get more of that vibe from this album there's certainly less electronic uh, influence on this album yeah a lot less industrial you know any tracks that are like gritty are gritty because there's lots of guitar on them yeah uh there's really only one track that's full of synth and i think it's my favorite track on the album <laughs> <laughs> yeah i uh i don't uh i don't know it's such a unique sound on this one okay um, <laughs> but i do like the song do you sleep <laughs> i know you didn't i i didn't yeah. uh what, what were your favorites okay uh i thought spies was was pretty good i mean yeah i like spies spies was good very cool synth mm-hmm. i felt like the drums overpowered like the mix <laughs> yes so i was very distracted by that yeah Aside from that, I feel like Spies is a really good song. Mm-hmm. I think that uh, the song Seconds to Nowhere mm-hmm. um, has a great synth track to it. It's very atmospheric, um, kind of a return to more of their industrial influences. Yeah. And I think that's my favorite track on the album. Okay. Beaver, uh, the Beaver Destroys the Forests. Um, it wasn't bad. It wasn't, it was just really like a lead in track for, you know, the next track on the album, which is called do you sleep in parentheses version yeah so, uh, yeah there's two tracks on this album called do you sleep cool yeah <laughs> um the second do you sleep i don't like the yeah. first one i think is good okay yeah the, i think the first one's good uh, the second one that was what more what i was referring to oh, when okay. i said that the <laughs> uh, that do you sleep was not very good yeah is the second one that appears in the album it's just i don't know what's going on with that like it's not mixed right and it's really droney and monotonous Mm -hmm. vocals is just really boring for me um i think if i'm gonna go out another positive note i think my second favorite song is probably uh depravity lane okay yeah yeah that's good that's a good song I would, I would really say the biggest problem with this album is actually just the production. I mean, you know, we were listening to it and we had to, uh, you know, we listened to it together to kind of get like, be like, okay, are, are we hearing the same thing, you know? Yeah. And like, yeah, the vocals sometimes are way drowned out. They're way too low. And sometimes they just spike randomly in a song. And then there's... Fly in the Ointment has arguably like the worst snare sample yeah. of all time. It's like, it has, it's really, really loud and super overbearing like it's the loudest thing in the song like there's a kick drum sample and there's a snare drum sample and you can't even hear the kick drum sample because the snare is so loud and yeah like echoes and covers instrumentation (laughs) um but yeah so some really weird stuff and um yeah i just uh i don't know really how to say they could have fixed it i mean i I guess uh, 
I I just would have liked to see more energy on this album. I think that's really where this album was lacking for mm-hmm. me. And it could have been due to the production, but it really felt like any songs that like would have been like energetic or kind of like up tempo songs like the vocals are so buried that you don't get that you know yeah. rawness or that you know that jump that you would get from like the last two albums mm-hmm. and so it just has this feeling of like really just repetition and just it almost feels like you're listening to the same song over and over again yeah i uh i really agree with that i just uh, and I'm sorry if you like this album. I know. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry if you like this I'm band. I'm very sorry. <laughs> but here's the thing, and and I do want to say that, like, in looking up these albums and kind of preparing for this episode, um, you know, we want to make sure that we had our grounds covered. Yeah. At least that, you know, we weren't going out on a limb and thinking this was, like, for some reason that we were just missing something. Yeah. Um, I know that like, quite a few people did not agree with our And Also the Trees. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, and... And I understand that. You know, when we were looking it up, there were some people who absolutely loved the albums that we talked about. But I think that's true of most bands that have kind of polarizing sounds. And I think this is another band that has kind of a polarizing sound. Yeah, but I will say this, is that like, I'll use and also Trees. Virus Meadow, right? Yeah. So, like I said, the album was better than the first album. And I mm-hmm. thought that that's really where they kind of were getting it together. And that's usually what most people would say and agree with. And even though I know you didn't like that band yeah. at all um <laughs> i will say that with alien sex being actually you know looking into a lot of the reviews and stuff the people who actually looked at these albums in depth they still like even years on you know like even after they were already considered somewhat pioneers mm-hmm. of death rock still people like noted a lot of these issues i would say for critics certainly so because if you if you look at you know their average reviews for almost all their albums it's pretty much like three out of five stars for like yeah. across the board even um, even from, with some of the fan ratings i mean it's pretty surprising well the fan ratings i found to be a little bit higher a little bit yeah. um and particularly with the first two albums you know for the purposes of this segment since we're only talking about four albums today uh the first two albums were much more enjoyed by the fans from what i found but this album in particular, like fans and critics seemed, from what I was reading, not to enjoy as much. People felt like it was kind of a departure from their sound and that it like suffered from monotony. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, so I don't understand why this was their best charting album. And so, yeah, it left me feeling very strange and like I was missing something. Yeah, I don't, <laughs> I don't know. I mean, like I, I, I do too. I feel like... W- we're missing something but like you know and i do like i said i do like songs from the first two albums yeah this one i don't really enjoy a ton of the material i don't know i don't know if it's not it didn't click with us in the same way that other bands do yeah I and mean, we do listen to a lot of music yeah. and i feel like we have pretty open minds about it mm-hmm. but man i just i don't know i just noticed that as a trend of that even fans or you know people who are would typically listen to just you know, different kinds of music. Yeah. We're still pretty harsh against them and some of their ratings. Mm-hmm. Um, I just wanted to point that out just in case anybody felt like doing any research like we did. Um, or in case anybody felt like, a, you know, arguing against us. <laughs> Maybe that too. <laughs> um, but we, yeah. We do welcome your opinions. Uh, of course we do. <laughs> I like it when our fans, you know, give us a, well, I don't know. It's just that they listened, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we understand that everybody has different opinions. You know, there's people who are going to be huge fans of this band. And if you are, I'm sorry that we're bashing your favorite band. I feel like we're bashing. I don't feel like we're bashing, but I feel like it's going to come across that way. Uh, That's always a problem, right? Yeah. Whenever you have an opinion that isn't just like overflowing with joy. (laughs) But yeah. Okay. So it's maximum security. I could say maximum okayness. Um, yeah, well, I mean, the title says it all, Maximum Security. They didn't take any risks. I guess I guess it's kind of true, yeah. I guess it, it kind of works. Wish I had said it. Everybody imagine that I said that instead of Robert. They did it. <laughs> um, but yeah, that's, uh, that's Maximum Security and some of the craziness going into this episode. Yep. Okay, so now we're going to get on to It, the album. Yes. But I do want to say that... Um, around this time, so at the release of Maximum Security, the band actually became 
uh, pretty popular in Japan, mm-hmm. and they actually released the live album um, in that same year. So instead of '85, when they released Maximum Security, there was Liquid Head in Tokyo. Yeah, they actually had a very big following in Japan, which um, isn't surprising. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Um, then uh, Freshwater left the band that same year. And then they continued as a trio. And of course, if you know anything, later they became a duo. Don't they currently still tour a little bit as a duo? Yeah, well, it's just the main two members, yeah. Nick Fiend and Mrs. Yeah. Fiend. Um, but um, they actually supported Alice Cooper inside 86. But then, yeah. um, so, you well, know, quite, they were uh, quite busy. <laughs> they were only like involved in bands prior to this that were essentially like Alice Cooper kind of influence or, yeah. I want to say, inspired bands yeah and so um the band released it the album right when uh, all this was going on you know i think they did did a lot better this time uh yeah i feel like the songwriting is a lot better on this album yeah there's still some issues with mixing and production but kind of at this point i've just come to accept that with this band yeah but it's definitely a step in the right direction from the last album. Mm-hmm. This album was released in 1986. So again, a year after the last album, they seem to be continuing that trend of uh, releasing an album every year. Yeah, like a lot of bands. Yep. Um, I thought it was very interesting that uh, the cassette version, <laughs> which was called It, the cassette. I know. It's <laughs> awesome. Um also included the previous album, Maximum Security. Mm-hmm. I don't know why, really. It would Maybe. have been like a full cassette. I it, mean, Jesus, yeah. yeah. Seriously, like 90-minute cassette or something. Like, I don't know if maybe there wasn't a cassette release for the last album. I don't know. Who knows? It was also later re-released on C format and included a few additional tracks. But I appreciated that they again retitled it for the format so it's called it the cd yeah so you have it the cassette <laughs> it the album for vinyl and then it the cd for the cd version yeah gotta give him a little clap on that one <laughs> this it's pretty good um and then also of course nick fiend painted the cover of this album mm-hmm. which is pretty cool i mean it's way better than maximum security I oh yeah say that. well it, it's more reminiscent of the second album yeah or, exactly but yeah it's definitely very out there kind of very psychedelic painting, mm-hmm. uh, lots of colors going on. It's a little creepy. You know? Yeah, but that's but, that's, yeah, that's, that's their thing. It's alien sex me. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I have to say that right off the bat, I I really like this album a lot more than I like Maximum Security. Oh, immensely better. Yeah, in terms <laughs> of sound, everything is produced and mixed a lot better. It's a lot more. There's a lot more energy to it. Yeah, I feel like at this point they're starting to find kind of more the right balance of like where vocals fit into music where like I felt like on earlier albums they kind of just went for it it feels like the vocals are more thought out for the specific instrumentation yeah I agree um I think that with this one I don't know I just found songs that I got a little bit more lost in it felt like less like I was aware I was listening to a song where yeah (laughs) that makes sense um, but song, especially songs like Manic Depression, which is 13 minutes long, and I just I really like the sound of it. Yeah, you know? I think that Manic Depression is one of the better songs on this album. Uh, I really appreciate the return of the synth on that. Yeah, on that no track. kidding. Not return of the Sith, return of the, the synth. synth, return of the synth <laughs> synthesizer, <laughs> <laughs> the Korg Wars, <laughs> <laughs> um, the Phantom Whammy. But yeah, so you have a return of synthesizers to this album, you know. Return this, of the Charvel. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Another another song this album does really good synth parts is Believe It or Not, mm-hmm. which I feel like does a really good job of blending the synthesizer parts yeah. with the guitars. Um, mm-hmm. And the guitars have, they're very punky, but they have kind of this surfy, washed out reverb added to them. I hate that word. <laughs> punky. Punky. <laughs> Okay, fine. They're more punk rock <laughs> and have a reverb added to them that is reminiscent of surf music. <laughs> hmm. Yes. Um, but I felt like it was a really cool effect for the guitars, and I felt like it made them blend with the synths really well. And so that's one of my favorite tr- tracks on the album. I also, I really like, uh, I think my favorite song on the album is Do It Right. 
but I just felt like it should have been mixed differently. Well, you felt they almost did it right. Yeah. For do it right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, I don't know. I mean, I, I like a decent amount of stuff in here. Smells like dot, dot, dot. I know, right? Yeah. Um, April showers. April showers, I didn't dislike, but I didn't really like either. Really? Okay, Wop Bop, I like that one a lot. Wop Bop was cool. Wop Bop, I like it a lot. Yeah. Um, <laughs> um, but yeah, I just felt like with this one, you know, I don't know what the thinking was really. It's it's hard to say with um, Alien Sex Fiend, especially with how much stuff they were creating. And the, I mean, it's a really long song. It's, you know, doing a lot of stuff in this a very small amount of time, you know, an album a year with a very unique sound. Yeah. I think that, um, especially with probably the success they'd had yeah. at this point with, you know, obviously Tokyo and, and Japan and, uh, you know, supporting Alice Cooper and everything like that. Mm-hmm. And I think it probably gave him a little bit different perspective on how yeah. an album should be produced. Um, and that's why you see such a huge jump from maximum well, we, security to this. We also have a return of an outside producer to this yeah. album because uh, their first two albums were produced with uh, outside producers, mm-hmm. but their third album, Maximum Security, was solely produced by them. Yeah, which for some bands works, mm-hmm. but I felt like it wasn't really for them. No, I I I agree. I think they needed direction from somebody to yeah. really get the songs the right way in the studio. Mm-hmm. I agree. Uh, this is also another one of those things where I just like honestly, I think it's better than. Like maximum security, like I generally, I, yeah, I genuinely do. No, I, I do as um, well. But it's it's one of those albums that seems to be less w- well known than the album that I think is worse. Yeah, that's what I don't understand about it. And then this album also brought up like another really uh, you know, a question that I kept asking myself when I was mm-hmm. listening to these albums. So the song "Get Into It" is again very much a return to kind of industrial influences and almost reminds me of skinny puppy with just less samples. Mm -hmm. And it made me like wonder why they're considered death rock sometimes. Yeah. um, Maybe someone can explain to us if we're missing something here. Why they're not industrial or anything like that. Or why they're so influential to death rock. Uh, I don't know. Mm. Yeah, just if anybody, if anybody understands the uh, any everything about maybe it's, it's just we don't like them. I don't. I don't. I don't, I don't know. know. I mean, I don't hate them. I just am not. No, like, I don't hate them either. I just I wouldn't choose to put them on in the car. You know. Yeah, I get it. Yeah, I would probably do. I'd probably do best of. I'll put it that way. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> There's plenty of compilations of them. That's for sure. Uh, even on Spotify, they have like, oh, like four <laughs> best of compilations. Uh, maybe a Bat Cave compilation that just included them. Oh, I'd, I'd I already, put that on. I already bought that. <laughs> <laughs> the the actual Bat Cave album. Yeah, yeah, I have that on vinyl. That's actually mm-hmm. one of the biggest reasons that they got really popular was that album. Yeah, we'll talk more about that. <laughs> I'm gonna do yeah more stuff about the Bat Cave. <laughs> um, but yeah, I I thought this was. You know, it's a good fourth album. And yeah, one of the things I just I just don't yeah, I'm just not the biggest Alien Sex Fiend fan. And uh, I know. This is a weird episode for us to do because I feel like you and I like if there's one of us who doesn't really like an album, usually the other one does. Yeah. And both of us just feel really meh about most of this material. Yeah. I did the, well, it's like what I just said, you know, I think for me personally, it's more of a greatest hits kind of band for for my taste. Yeah. Um, but I think that the I can see some people really like it. I mean, no, I I know we're gonna get comments from people that are like, "Oh, this band is great! Like, you're totally missing this." I turned it off after three minutes. You know? like, <laughs> yeah. I couldn't possibly listen to one more second. Um, <laughs> like, yeah, we get it. <laughs> like, like it, we know there's like a huge love for this band. Um, yeah, absolutely. But uh, I guess they just don't. Have appeal to us i don't know we tried to be as objective as possible when we were doing this review in particular yeah because we wanted to be honest like 
you know, we're not going to sugarcoat it. We're not going to say that we love these albums, that they're the greatest things yeah. of all time. If we don't feel that way. We'll have another and also the trees. <laughs> I, I, we're uh, arguably, at least I'm being less critical of this than I was of and, and also, also the, the trees. trees yeah. <laughs> I, would, I listen to them, <laughs> like, at least. Um, yeah, you, uh, you don't listen to them in your free time. No, no, no. no. <laughs> um, but yeah, that's um it the album and that is gonna wrap up our alien sex fiend quattro of albums yeah i'm sorry if anyone was expecting the super polarized debate that we usually have on the show unfortunately i feel like we both didn't have super strong opinions about these albums uh yeah we listened to it a lot and you know we we really give a shot you know i always try to think about it in the context of you know, uh, not only what I enjoy, but you know, mm-hmm. like what, like what, you, know, you gotta put yourself in the mindset of some of these bands, you know? And like, like, you know, for it, just even doing research on it, like, oh, like if it's death rock, you know, yeah. like, like being like, okay, well, uh, Christian death, this is the only death rock band, like the most popular one. So that's what I'm familiar with. And then you go into Fortress of Grave, you're like, oh, this is terrible. Cause this doesn't sound anything like death rock. You know, it's like, that's like, oh no, this is, this is death rock too. But you know, and that is not our opinion, by the way. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. So, um, at least it's not mine. <laughs> yeah. So, um, I really try to put myself in the mindset of, you know, really going into hardcore review these albums. And, you know, I'd, I'd listened to Alien Sex Fiend before. Yeah. And I'd had, um, definitely with their, their second album, Acid Bath. Um, that's one that, you know, comes up a lot in what we do. Mm-hmm. And that was the album that I enjoyed the most. Yeah. From this. Exactly. Well, I mean, like, it has probably my favorite songs on it. Yeah. But, <laughs> It um, this one just just going into it. I think the material just unfortunately didn't wow me as much as the songs that I enjoyed from them. Like yeah. the songs that kind of peaked out that I had heard over the years. Mm-hmm. You know, those were the songs that I ended up liking the most, yeah. and it didn't really change my mind. Unlike when we do, some, whereas we did when we did the Christian Death like review. Yeah, like we were blown away by Ashes. Like yeah. Well, then, uh, you know, and even the scriptures and yeah, atrocities, yeah, it, you know, like, like uh, doing the Valor Candy era stuff. Like, yeah. we, there was albums that we were like, oh my God, like, I um, can't believe, like, like, yeah, you know, exactly. And I was expecting not to like those albums as much, you know, as, as I thought I would. And yeah. well, it's because you listen to a lot of stuff in passing and then exactly. you form like short, you know, non cohesive opinions about things. But, you know, when you're doing a show like this, you sit down, you listen to albums again and again mm-hmm. and again, trying yep. to form a very strong opinion or very, you know, solid put together idea about a band. Yeah. And ha- after doing that, I still just didn't really have anything passionate to say about them really. Yeah. I, uh, I agree. You know, I didn't, it just didn't, it didn't appeal to me in the way that I, you know, like other bands where they just jump out of me. I'm yeah. like, Whoa, you know? Um, so I'm really sorry about that. If like, if, somebody sitting there with an alien sex fiend tattoo with, yeah. you know, with their head shaved and has the alien sex fiend shaved into the hair and they got plastic surgery to look like Nick fiend. Uh, well, if you did that, I'm sorry, that's just a mistake. <laughs> <laughs> he's a very unique looking man. I'm not saying he's a bad looking man. It's just, it's a waste of money. Well, I guess, yeah, you should be looking at it like yourself anyway. Yeah. Um, that was my point. Makeup, <laughs> makeup can fix a lot of things too. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Um, so yeah, I hope you've enjoyed this. Hopefully. Hopefully. I mean, I don't know. I feel like this is going to be just another one of those like, oh man, where I could just feel the hate mail already. And it, we promise the next episode will be very more, happy. Yeah. Oh <laughs> um, yeah. I definitely feel like this is going to be a, a pretty big hate mail episode. <laughs> just like the, and also the trees episode was. So, um, actually we, I, we took more hate for the Cocteau Twins episode. We did get a lot of Chris for the Cocteau Twins episode. It, which is funny because we loved that. Yeah, day. I love them. Yeah, we loved them. <laughs> we, just we just didn't like the albums that other people liked. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. Yeah, we were... Yeah, like, you know, we really enjoyed Treasure and I, I love Victoria Land. And yeah. Like, both those albums are, are great. Mm-hmm. Treasure's better. Um, but, yeah. like, Head Over Heels, like, I just... 
I like Head Over Heels. But I don't we got, like, like the album for that. Garland. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, people like, but people just reamed us. I know <laughs> because we we weren't crazy about Garlands or Head Over Heels. Everyone's like, how can you not love those albums? I know. So I'm sorry. Like we well, just talked about the albums that do? we liked. I know. <laughs> so, but that's that's what you do. I mean, that's what the whole that's what this whole podcast is about. It's about yeah. sharing what we think about music and seeing if seeing what other people think about it and put our opinions out there but I have a feeling it's going to be one of those ones where either we're going to have everybody agree with us or we're going to have nobody agree with us yeah <laughs> um, but yeah I hope you've enjoyed this episode this is episode 35 of Gothcast I'm Dr. Sanders I'm Robbie Gore and Gothcast is brought to you in part by the Belfry Network Belfry oh by the way we're going to be on Cemetery Confessions I think probably by the time this is released we'll have already been on pretty close It'll be near that. It'll be close. Yeah. Yeah, So, uh, we're on episode thirty-four of Cemetery Confessions. We just released thirty-four, so it's kind of funny. Yeah. uh, And then we're on thirty-four. Yeah. Um, But yeah, if you want to go check that out, it's much more casual for us. Mm -hmm. Uh, We tend to have a a very specific itinerary for when we do these episodes. Yeah. When we do our show, we have a very focused. Goal of mine, we kind of let loose a little bit on that show. A little um, bit, yeah. <laughs> if you want to so, see, uh, if you want to see uh, Doctor Sanders and Robbie Gore uncut, then uh, check out that episode. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, I don't, I don't even know how else to describe it. <laughs> it's a very. It's, we it, have short attention spans. It was, it was like three <laughs> and a half hours long or something. I mean, it was a very long time for us. We do. We do like an hour long podcast. <laughs> I'm sorry to count. Yes, sorry count. <laughs> um, but yeah, if you want to see a different, much more casual side and actually get to know us a little bit more uh, as people, I suppose. I guess I don't know. We talk a little bit more about like our. I guess we talk about our past on here too with music. So yeah, I don't know. Go listen to it. It's interesting. Yeah, counts awesome. Yes, um, yes. <laughs> plus he, you know, the Belfry. So, uh, <laughs> speaking of the Belfry, uh, you can find um, links to blogs, podcasts, um, YouTube channels, just everybody creating um, content related to goth culture. So, if you're new to goth or you're an old timer, you know, your wings are all like stretched out and worn out, um, just like mine, then you can <laughs> go there and, and find some that'll suit you. So, um, the address is www. The Belfry, which is T H E B E L F R Y dot R I P. It's a wonderful URL. Yes, it is. And let's just bombard you with all social media. Yeah. So, of course, we have our Instagram, which is just Gothcast. Again, we have our Facebook page, again, Gothcast. We have our Gmail account, which is gothcastradio gmail.com. We have our website, which is where we host all of our content. So, it's an easy place to find everything that we produce. That's gothcastradio.com. No www, because why would we do that? And then we have our YouTube channel, Gothcast Space Video. Uh, not the word space, just a space. Yeah. Um, <laughs> we also space video. <laughs> <laughs> we also have a Twitter account and a Tumblr account. Yeah. Um, so you can find us on any of those mediums, and we're always happy to respond to comments, questions, mm-hmm. requests. In fact, we've done a number of episodes based on requests. I thought this was one, but then I guess it wasn't. It w- this actually wasn't a requested episode, surprisingly. Oh, I guess it's been a while since we hadn't done one. <laughs> <laughs> so, But yeah, yeah, feel free to reach out if you are so inclined. Yeah, and stay spooky. Stay spooky.